Welcome to Bullying and Cyberbullying, presented by Must Stop Bullying. My name is Brad Snyder, and I'm the Executive Director of the Dion Initiative for Child Wellbeing and Bullying Prevention. And today we're going to be talking about preventing and addressing bullying and cyberbullying. But before we do, we need to look at the definition of bullying, because not all forms of interpersonal conflict are bullying. And those things that separate bullying out from other forms of interpersonal conflict provide insight into what exactly works to prevent bullying or to stop it once it is occurring. Bullying is defined by four things. The first is that there is always an imbalance of power between the bully and the victim. Typically, that imbalance of power is a physical one, where the bully is just larger and physically more powerful than the victim. But of course, we can see that bullies can use other things to create that imbalance of power. They can use their social capital. In other words, they can motivate groups of people against a victim. And motivating that group of people creates that imbalance of power. And of course, in a modern age, we see people using technology to create an imbalance of power between them and the victim. But for it to be bullying, that imbalance of power has to always be present. A second part of the definition of bullying that sets it apart from other forms of interpersonal conflict is that bullying is repeated. Bullying is never a single act. Now, of course, cyberbullying makes this a little bit more complicated because sometimes a single hurtful post or message can be repeated by the medium itself. But it's that repetition that makes bullying bullying and is part of its definition and separates it from other forms of interpersonal conflict. A third and really critical component of the definition of bullying and cyberbullying that set them apart from other forms of interpersonal conflict is that bullying is intentional. And here's where you can start to really see how bullying looks different and is different from other things like harassment or, or teasing. For example, when you confront a teaser about the harm that they are causing their victim, that teaser will say, well, no, you know, that person knows when I call them that name, that, that I'm just joking, that, that this is how we communicate. This is part of our rapport. This is part of our relationship. It's actually this kind of thing that we do. And you can look at that relationship and you can see that the teasing behavior is repeated like it is with bullying. And you can often see that there's an imbalance of power between the teaser and his or her victim. But when you confront the teaser about the pain that they're causing their victim, the teaser will change his or her behavior. When you confront a bully with the pain that they are causing their victim, you reward the bully. Scientists have actually done this. They've hooked up bullies to measure their response to the pain being caused to their victims. And when you confront an actual bully, with the pain being caused their victim, they register that as arousal because it is their intent to harm the victim, to make them do, behave, think ways that they otherwise would not. And finally, an important characteristic of bullying is that in order for the bullying to occur, you must first have a victim and typically this victim has low social capital. In other words, this victim has weak relationships with their peers and with adults. They tend not to be seen by the adults and the kids in their lives. And that makes them ideal victims for bullies. So the, for the bullying to occur, you have to have the victim, you have to have the bully, and the bully has what I call tenuous social capital. They tend to be well known by their peers, but they don't tend to have strong connections with them. 
And that's part of why they actually engage in this behavior is because they're trying desperately to hold on to the value that their peers have given them. But finally, for the bullying to occur in virtually every incident of bullying, there's this third group, which we call bystanders. These are individuals that are neither bullies nor victims. And some researchers like to divide that group into many subcategories, but the important thing for you to know is that those bystanders tend to have healthy social capital. They tend to have stronger relationships with their peers than do bullies or victims, and they tend to have stronger relationships with adults. And that group, that characteristic of bullying, the fact that it always occurs with bystanders present becomes really important when we start to implement um, programs and processes for either preventing bullying or stopping when it occurs. Now, here is a, a quiz for everybody watching this webinar right now, and that's this, which is worse, in-person bullying or cyberbullying? Well, if you said cyberbullying, that shows me that you've been paying attention, paying attention to the news, to what gets reported on in newspapers, news programs, the radio. But unfortunately, that's incorrect. We know that roughly 50% more kids experience in-person bullying than do cyberbullying. But the perception among people that care about kids is that cyberbullying is much worse. And I've given that a lot of thought. And I think it's because for people that care about kids, we know what we would do to protect a kid from in-person bullying. If nothing else worked, we would, we would simply stand by that kid. We would physically be present to them and protect them from being bullied. But cyberbullying is happening in a space that we can't wrap our arms around. In fact, when we work with social media groups to end or put in processes to stop bullying and cyberbullying, as soon as we figure out one social network, kids leave and they go to a different social network. So we figure out how to work with Facebook to stop bullying. And Kids leave Facebook. We figure out how to work with Instagram or Snapchat to, um, to help prevent cyberbullying. And kids leave those social networks and go to TikTok. We figure out TikTok and they go somewhere else. Well, I have some good news for you or for anybody who, like me, is worried about cyberbullying. And that is that we now know that virtually every incident of cyberbullying is tied to an incident of in-person bullying. And when I first heard that, it, it, it took me a little while to figure it out. But when I spoke to kids about this, they, they helped me understand it. You see, kids like us are used to people saying harmful things online. When they go to their favorite YouTube channel and, and look at the comments under a favorite YouTube video, they'll undoubtedly see somebody saying something negative about them as a fan of that video. But kids don't register those harsh comments as cyberbullying. They tell us that they're used to people saying harmful, harmful things online. They register it as cyberbullying when the harmful things that are being said are being said by people that they have to interact with in their school environment and are being said to people that they have to interact with in their school environment. It's not that something harmful was said, it's that they have to experience the consequences of those harmful things in person. And that's where the hope lies, because now we know that if we eliminate the in-person bullying, if we get and help our young people treat each other better in person, we now can eliminate the cyberbullying. So how prevalent is bullying and cyberbullying? Well, roughly a quarter of youth in Arizona report being bullied in a typical year. 
and the national average is closer to 20%. So 19% of youth in the US report being bullied in a typical year. So in Arizona, our kids experience bullying at much higher levels. And about 19% of kids in Arizona experience cyberbullying in a typical year. Again, that number is higher than the national average. But there you also see that roughly 50% more kids experience in-person bullying than do cyberbullying. What then are the consequences of bullying? Why do we care so much about it? Well, for one thing, we know that victims of bullying have decreased academic performance. And that's because virtually all bullying occurs at or near school. And because of that, kids who experience bullying or victims of it have a, a stark change in their relationship with school. Um, and that causes their academic performance to decline. But we also know that entire schools that have bullying problems experience decreased academic performance. It seems that just having bullying in the environment makes that school a more difficult place in which to learn. So even if you're not a victim of bullying, but bullying is happening in your school environment, you're less likely to learn and you perform more poorly on standardized tests. So when we look for reasons to stop and prevent bullying, we have to think about beyond just what happens to the victim, and also look what is happening to the entire community when that bullying is allowed to occur. We also know from some very good longitudinal research that victims of bullying experienced increased depression and other mental health issues clear into adulthood. Finally, and this is a, a, dip, a difficult one to wrap our heads around. There are increased suicidal behaviors among victims of bullying and cyberbullying. We have to be very careful here. Bullying does not cause suicides, but it can be a factor in some juvenile suicides. And again, um, the statistics on this are that in a given year, roughly 23% of female youth contemplate suicide, but among bullied female youth, that number jumps up to 45.1%. And you know, we need to kind of put some of those suicidal, um, those suicide numbers in context. Um, because we tend to think of these problems, bullying, cyberbullying, suicide, as being specific to a population, that it's not a societal suicide problem, it is a juvenile suicide problem. And I just want to give you a couple numbers to think about. So in Arizona in 2015, which is the last year we have complete successful suicide data, roughly 6.3 out of 100 thousand 10 to 17 year olds committed suicide in 2015 and in that year that number was up slightly from the previous year mostly due to female youths in that same year though 22.3 out of every 100,000 35 to 55 year olds committed suicides and i chose that demographic because that's roughly the age of the parents of our youth. So in other words, the co their people their parents age are committing suicides at rate about four times as great as they are. So when we think about things like bullying, like cyberbullying, or like suicide, we have to keep it in a context and realize that it's not just a juvenile problem sometimes, that it's a larger community problem. When we think about the consequences of bullying and cyberbullying, we also have to recognize that people who commit or are victims or are witnesses of bullying are more likely to commit dating violence 
as young people and sexual violence as adults. There is something about being present to the kind of manipulation and harm that is caused in the bullying dynamic that make both the bullies, the victims, and the bystanders more likely to engage in dating violence. So if we care about things like the Me Too movement, or if we care in general about dating violence, about rape, about other forms of sexual violence, then we care about stopping and preventing bullying. So with all of that bad news about all of the harmful consequences of bullying, of course, we want to get right into, well, then what works to prevent bullying and to stop bullying once it has started? But for me to explain that, it's useful for me to tell you a little bit about what does not work. So one of the things that does not work to stop bullying is peer mediation. And look, I, I take some blame for this because the first time I was asked about what works or what a school could do to stop bullying, I immediately went to peer mediation because peer mediation had worked in the late 90s to stop other forms of school-based violence. So researchers like me immediately went back to that literature and, and thought, well, maybe this is going to be the key to stopping bullying um, now, now that it's become a bigger issue. The problem is, if you think about what mediation actually involves, you can start to see why not only does it not work, but it creates harm for the victim. In a traditional mediation, two sides give up parts of their position to find common ground. But what does a victim of bullying have to give up? If you recall, I told you that the victim was picked not for something that they've actively done to harm the bully, but the victim was picked because they had low social capital. The victim was picked because they were weaker and had fewer friends than other kids in that environment. So what does the victim have to give up? And yet we sat bullies and victims down together for mediation. And the bully would say something like, oh, I did look at him and he just makes me so angry because he's so weak and he's such a loser and an outsider. Well, how is the victim supposed to respond to that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm weak. I'm, I'm going to get stronger. You know, I have been eyeing a gym membership. And at the same time, we were re-traumatizing victims by forcing them to explain the harm that was caused to them. And as I've already explained to you, every time they explained their harm to the bully, we were rewarding the bully. So peer mediation does not work to stop bullying um, once it's occurring. Another thing that does not work to stop bullying are these zero tolerance or three strikes you're out policies. And there's a couple reasons for that. I'm going to address um, to them separately. The first is, remember those bystanders that I talked about? Those people that were neither the victims nor the bullies? The ones that had better relationships than victims or bullies with other peers and with adults? Well, we need them to tell us as caring adults when the bullying is occurring. Because as I've mentioned, victims tend to be invisible to us and bullies are very good at picking locations for bullying that are outside of our view. It's those bystanders that we rely on to know if the bullying is occurring because for a reason I'm going to address in a little bit, victims won't tell us either. So bullies aren't going to tell us, victims aren't going to tell us, those bystanders. Well, when we implemented in schools these zero tolerance policies, which typically meant that if a bullying occurred, that the bully would be expelled, we alienated bystanders. Bystanders told us, look, I don't want the bullying to occur, but I'm not willing to get the bully in that much trouble. That's just way too much pressure for me. Like I want it to stop and I, I would tell you about it, 
but getting him or her kicked out of school, boy, that's just way too much pressure for me. So zero tolerance policies don't work for that reason, but they also don't work because they focus on the bully. They make the bully the cause of the problem. Now, when I was describing the bully earlier, you remember I said that they have a tenuous social capital, that they're engaging in the bullying behavior in order to get value in the eyes of their peers. Well, if you get rid of that bully, you still have that environment that rewarded the bullying behavior to begin with. So another bully is just gonna jump in. The key is not to focus on the bully, but to focus on that environment in which bullies get value, get esteem, get rewarded by their peers or by the larger community for that coercive bullying behavior. By the way, we also know that the long-term prognosis for bullies is pretty bleak. They're much more likely than non-bullies to engage in criminal activities, to perform poorly academically, and to have relationship problems clear into adulthood. So as people that care about kids, we don't want to get rid of bullies. Rather, we want to change that environment that rewarded the bully for that behavior. Something else that doesn't work, speakers, assemblies, and look, as a speaker, I recognize the irony in that statement, but too often we at schools will hold and have held anti-bullying rallies. We bring in an outside group and we get everybody excited about preventing bullying. And then that group goes away and we've done nothing in the day-to-day -day activities of the school to actually change the environment that allowed that bullying to occur. And so the statistics, the science is fairly clear. Single assemblies do not work to stop or prevent, prevent bullying. Finally, if you can see these splitting, spinning plates, you know that I recognize that our schools have a lot to do. We keep giving them more things. We, we make them responsible for nutrition. We make them responsible for um, drug prevention, not just education. And we keep adding things, including adding bullying prevention programs. Well, too often in those layers, we start running programs that actually undermine each other. So if you're aware of your school's school climate program, then you know that that is your bullying prevention program. You shouldn't run a bullying prevention program on top of your school climate program. Why? Because they're gonna use different language for the same behavior. And your staff and your kids will get confused. They'll be getting inconsistent messaging and be taught inconsistent uh, skills and tools for coping. So your behavior management plan, your school climate plan, is your bullying prevention plan. If they're separate, pick one and make them um, and use them universally so that everybody's on the same page using the same language. Now the good news, what does work to prevent bullying and to stop bullying when it does occur? Well, one thing that works is clearly commuted expectations. Do your students know what to do when they witness bullying? Do they know what they're supposed to do in terms of reporting and to whom they're supposed to report? Do they know how to intervene? Has that been explicitly communicated? Has it been posted in ways to remind them? And let's go one step further. Is it the case that you also have clearly communicated to your children, to your students, how they're expected to treat other people, how they're expected to treat um, new kids at the school, kids that have had trouble fitting in or making friends. Do you have a code of conduct that lays out how everybody in your community treats one another? What they do when they see one of them being alienated or hurt? 
because and this is building on a very very rich body of scientific information when humans are told what to do we're more likely to do it by the way that those expectations are set in arizona law that all arizona schools are supposed to have a bullying prevention policy and then that policy is supposed to be communicated to parents and to kids. Something else that works to prevent bullying is valuing the diverse characteristics and contributions of all of the community members. Think back to what I said about that bullying dynamic. For bullying to occur, you had to have a victim, you had to have a bully, and you had to have bystanders. And that victim was picked because they had low social capital, weak connections with their peers. And one of the reasons why they had low social capital is that they weren't valued by their peers. Their peers had no reason to look out for them or embrace them as part of the community. And as adults who care about kids, it's sometimes incumbent on us to create that value for all of the students that we care about. And I know that that sounds touchy-feely, but let me give you an example of how this works. Imagine that it's a, it's a Tuesday morning and there's school announcements. It simply looks like this. Whoever makes the announcement says, um, hello school and welcome today. By the way, last night the girls volleyball team won another match. If you see members of the girls volleyball team in the hall, make sure you congratulate them. Also, we have a fourth grader, um, Bob Smith. He took second in the regional spelling competition over the weekend. If you see Bob in the hallway, please congratulate him. Wow, aren't we such a better place, such a more special place for having such great athletes and great spellers? There's no other school like us that has all of these talents under one roof. And then that person who makes those announcements and the next time they make announcements figures out ways to recognize other students. I'm not talking about participation trophies. I'm talking about providing opportunities for all students to demonstrate something that they're good at and to be recognized and rewarded for it so that other students see them as valuable to that community. Because if other students see you as valuable, then they're not going to let you be victimized. And if students even value bullies for reasons other than being bullied, those bullies are less likely to engage in that bullying behavior. Another hallmark of schools that are bullying free is that they, they devote class time to teaching relationship skills and to addressing relationship issues. The fact that class time is actually used to address relationship means that all the students in that class take it seriously, those relationship and those relationship skills. You see, the bully, as I mentioned, is trying to establish connection with their peers and the victim doesn't have connections with his peers and the bully is engaging in those behaviors those bullying behaviors to gain value because they don't have a better way see we're born needing relationships without any idea how to obtain or maintain them we have to learn those skills and some of our students have not learned good relationship skills by the time they get to school. And they will do poorly, both academically and socially, until they do. And schools that teach relationship skills have fewer problems, uh, behavior problems, and perform better academically. And again, you know, it sounds touchy-feely. It's really not. There are evidence-based curriculum that schools can buy that are as thought out, as laid out, that have all of the worksheets and lesson plans, the same way that you go about buying a science curriculum. And let me give you an idea of just what that looks like and an example of a school that I visited here um, in Arizona, a school that was using an evidence-based 
um, social emotional learning curriculum. And in that curriculum, they had lessons for what to teach every day. Um, they had scenarios that they taught students. Uh, they had role playing exercises that they went through with the students. And on the particular day that I was observing, this was a fourth grade class and it was about halfway through the school year. So the students had already learned that every day they come in and they do a check-in. This check-in happens roughly after lunch. And the check-in is where it's a safe space for anyone in the class to address any problems that they're having with other students in the class or with other students in general. And those problems get talked about with it as a group with the teacher moderating. If there are no problems, then the teacher then um, provi um, provides scenarios and does role playing to teach different skills and to preemptively address situations that students might face in their relationships. And on this particular day, the teacher said to the class, hey, anything going on? And maybe because I was there, no students had any problems to report. So the teacher said, um, you know, I have something. He said, Cindy, at the beginning of the year, you know, you and Barbara were friends. And then I noticed that you stopped standing by each other in line or sitting um, by each other at recess um, or at lunch and stopped playing with each other at recess. And then I noticed this week that, that you and Barbara are back together again. Can you tell me what happened there? And Cindy said, well, yes, both Barbara and I like Mary and we wanted to play with Mary, but Mary said she wouldn't play with either of us unless we could learn to get over our differences. So we did. And the teacher said to Mary, Mary, you did that? And Mary said, yeah, well, I like Cindy and I like Barbara and they're both great. And they had had an argument and the argument was silly. And I told them that if we could work out the argument that all of us could play together and have a lot more fun, but I wasn't going to choose between them. So we worked it out. And the teacher said, Mary, that's incredible. Thank you so much. Class, let's give Mary a round of applause. You know, he recognized Mary for using skills that she had developed in that class. And at that moment, I can guarantee two things. One, Mary's value in the eyes of her peers went up. But two, there were other kids in that class that thought to themselves, boy, you know, I bet that I could do that. I bet I could help bridge peace and bring people together. And um, I bet I could be recognized for being somebody that helps people overcome their differences. So that's as simple as it looks um, to devote class time to relationship skills and it works. Finally, and remember I talked about how those bystanders are so important. Well, we need to engage them if we're going to prevent bullying because as I've mentioned, they're the ones that are gonna tell us that the bullying has occurred. And I wanna take things a step further than just engaging them and empowering them and effectively communicating to them that they need to intervene. They need to reach out to kids that aren't part of groups and help them be part of groups, that they need to be the ones that help establish value in peers that don't have value in the other's eyes, that they need to be the ones that intervene when they see bullying and go get an adult to help. And I want to go a step further and I want to engage their parents as well. Because while Arizona state law, the law that I presented earlier, does require that parents of victims and bullies get notified, I want parents of bystanders to be notified too, because we know that those bystanders have stronger relationships with the adults in their life. And I think a lot of work can be done with our parents when you and I talk to our kids about expectations for when they see bullying, not just talking about them when, to them when they've been victimized, not just talking to them when we worry that they are a perpetrator, but talking to them about how they're supposed to intervene when they see somebody getting hurt, what they're supposed to do when they see somebody 
ostracize, what they're supposed to do without, to help outcasts or new kids or kids who've been marginalized. That is when we're gonna see a real difference in bullying in our schools and communities. You know, Must Stop Bullying created a video to show kids exactly how easy it is to be a bystander and intervene on behalf of a victim. Take a look at it here. Hey, Shorty, where are you coming from? The library. Your classmate is pushed around every day and you want to do something, but what? No, you don't have to be a superhero to stand up to bullying. You can make a difference just by being you. Hey, Shorty. Hey, ready for class? Huh? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Standing up to bullying isn't as hard as you think. Visit muststopbullying.org to learn how. I think you can see in that example um, that what we intentionally showed was a bully and a victim that he thought was alone. That the, vic that the bully thought didn't have those, that social value, those connections with others. And all that bystander did was give value to that victim, was a peer to him, was uh, a support. You didn't have to confront the bully. And I know that our kids sometimes build it up in their mind that any sort of confrontation or any sort of act to stop bullying inevitably becomes a physical conflict or an argument. And what we're trying to show is, no, that's not what we're asking bystanders to do. What we're asking bystanders to do is to show bullies that victims aren't alone, that they're valuable, that they have peers. And in doing that, show bully that there's a different way to exist in that school. This video and several videos like it are on the Must Stop Bullying website, muststopbullying.org, and they're free for your communities to use. The other thing that we, that works to stop bullying when it occurring is involving trusted adults. You know, bullying is not going to go away um, and, and kids are not gonna to be able to stop it without adults to help them intervene. And one of the other videos that Must Stop Bullying created um, was to help kids show how easy it could be to start a conversation like this with a trusted adult, even when, uh, you know, it seems scary. Later, loser. You're bullied every day and you wanna tell someone, but you're scared to be seen. Now what? Coach Johnston, over here. No, you don't have to be intimidated to stand up to bullying. Talking to an adult can seem scary, but you can do it. Hey, Coach Johnston. Hey. I have something to tell you. Standing up for yourself isn't as hard as you think. Visit muststopbullying.org to learn how. Again, that's another one of the videos that are available, and the videos are available in English and in Spanish, and they also address cyberbullying, and they also address um, parental behaviors as well. So what else can adults do to stop and prevent bullying? Well, one is to not be judgmental. What I'm hearing from our kids is that they report bullying to teachers and, and, and teachers are making decisions about whether or not to intervene. They are judging whether or not the potential victim uh, deserved the treatment or not. And this is really harming some of our kids and preventing them from ever going back to these uh, adults with, with issues. So what I'm wanting everybody to do is to, to not be judgmental. You can, re, you can relieve yourself of that responsibility. You can decide that you aren't going to judge whether or not the victim that came to you needs help or not. Because regardless, if they've come to you, there's probably something that you can do to help and there's probably a real need on their behalf. The other thing that I'm encouraging people to do is to not initially ask what happened. You see, as people that care about kids, if a kid comes to us, especially a kid that we have a relationship, especially one that where we're their trusted adult, 
you know, we're sometimes incredulous that that kid was victimized. And it's the first thing we ask, isn't it? We say, well, what happened? Why would they, why would they, what they do to you? Why would they do that? You're so great. What did they say? And it turns out that's the last thing that a kid wants to tell. If we're the trusted adult in the life of a kid, that child is afraid that we are going to view them the same way that the bully does. The bully's told them why they're being treated that way. The bully has worked actually really hard to make the victim believe that they deserve the treatment. And oftentimes the worst thing that happens in a bullying dynamic is that the victim starts to believe that they deserve to be victimized. But the last thing that that child wants is for us as the trusted adult to start to see them the same way that the bully does. So don't lead with that question. And I know that at some point the bullying needs to be documented and needs to be written down somewhere, especially if you're gonna take action. But what I'm advocating for is a break. When you first start talking with a child that's come to you with a bullying problem, first of all, let them know that they did nothing to deserve the bullying, which is true because the bullying is never really about the victim. Tell them again, you've done nothing to deserve the bullying. Let them know that you're going to work with them to solve the problem. And only after that trust has been solidified, only after that child feels safe, do you start to ask them the details. It doesn't happen, it doesn't have to happen until you've taken care of the needs of that child. And we need to look at the forms we use too. If you think about how difficult it can be for a child to bring a problem like this to an adult, and oftentimes then the first thing we do is have them fill out a form, a complaint. Oh, you were very brave in coming to me with this problem. Please relive it again on paper. Make it permanent right now before I've done anything to ensure that you're okay. So even our paperwork has to be adjusted to make sure that our kids are safe before we get into the details, address their needs before we address the activity or the incident that put them in need. And finally, ask the child what the child thinks should be done. This is particularly important advice for parents. Kids have told me in research that one of the reasons that they don't report bullying to their parents is because they don't want their parents to contribute to the drama, to use a phrase that they use. You see, as people that care about kids, if somebody comes to us and tells us about bullying, we wanna leap into action, we wanna fix it. Well, our kids are worried that we're gonna make it worse when we do. Furthermore, oftentimes our kids know what to do, they just need some support to do it. They might know who to tell. They might know who to go to, who to reach out to, but they're scared to, they haven't done it before. And they just need our support to make those, um, to take that action. So before we leap into action ourselves, ask the child what he or she thinks should be done to solve the bullying. If for example, they say, well, you know, I really should go tell this teacher, then that's a great opportunity for us to practice relationship skills. We can say to them, well, you know, what are you gonna say? Let's rehearse it. How about I'll be the teacher, you be you. Let's flip it. I'll be you, you be the teacher. Let's go through because relationships, those types of conversation can be practiced the same way that a sport can be practiced, the same way that any skill can be practiced and we'll get better at it. I wanna thank you for spending this time with me to learn about bullying and cyberbullying. If you have any questions or comments about things that you heard in this video or other things related to bullying or cyberbullying, I recommend that you reach out to muttstopbullying.org or you can contact me directly at brad at Thank you.